been uh, really good to meet Nick and uh, share ideas with him. So um, Nick has graciously agreed to present some of his ideas. He's not going to give you all of his secrets because, uh, you know, he wants to keep some to himself, but uh, he's a very, uh, very generous guy in terms of sharing information. So thanks so much, Nick. Thinking about maybe why I wanted to give this presentation in the first place. And I had a bit of a spiel that I wanted to say, but then I was listening to, um, I don't know if anybody here listens to the Trout Bitten podcast. That's a wonderful podcast uh, by a gentleman in Pennsylvania and some of his friends, uh, Dominic Swintoski. And there's just like tons of great information that they discuss there. But the, the latest podcast they had was about uh, what has changed in fly fishing. And they kind of ramble on about just some of the different aspects that have changed. But he says something in the intro that really, really stuck with me. And it could, the timing couldn't have been better because I was thinking about maybe why I was giving this presentation. And uh, and he talks about how when you're brand new to fly fishing, you don't know anything. You're uncomfortable with everything. You're getting all kinds of information dumped on top of you. Uh, you're kind of surveying the landscape to see, you know, what's trending, what's popular now, what are other people doing. Um, and whatever that, whatever happens and whatever information you kind of grab onto at the beginning, that sort of stays with you through your, your time period through fly fishing. So, um, it sort of lays the groundwork or the foundation for anything that comes next. And so you might gain more tactics and more skills. You might learn new rivers, but whatever those, those first sort of, um, uh, steps that, that, uh, that you take into the sport, they're going to stay with you. Uh, and for myself personally, when I first started fly fishing, it was really in the middle of that like match the hatch obsession that was taking place at the time where people were telling you that you needed to use a specific dubbing blend to match the Hendrickson Mayfly, uh, a lot of uh, technical dry fly fishing going on and um, that match the hatch and getting your flies as absolutely close to that like real bug or whatever as you could. Um, that was the secret to success. Whereas I think now in today's day and age, there's lots of different um, techniques out there. There's probably an onus a little more on presentation, which I think is uh, a lot, that's a lot better of a lesson. Presentation always beats fly pattern as far as um, uh, really where you want to put a lot of your energy is getting those proper presentations, those drag free drifts, uh, rather than obsessing, do I have the right fly? That's probably the least important factor uh, in trout fishing, at least from my opinion. Uh, as close as you can to the naturals that that these fish are feeding on, uh, it's just not a bad idea. You're you're going to have more success, and you're going to have more successful fishing trips in doing so. Um, the other the other reason why I kind of just get all obsessed with uh, uh, trying to match my flies to what the naturals are um, is it just does provide a creative outlet for myself. I love fly tying, as I was saying in the intro uh, when I was speaking to you, David. Um, I really feel like fly tying is just such a lovely part of this sport if you really want to go out there and catch a big trout well the probably the best way is to either use a night crawler or throw a rappella on uh, and just be done with it but instead we sort of complicate our lives and uh, we try to uh, complicate the techniques and for whatever reason uh, we find enjoyment in making it harder on ourselves so i think uh, uh, a lot of the presentation that i'm going to give today is going to be less about hey use this fly and more so about this is why i do certain things that i do and maybe you'll take that and run with it and tying your own fly patterns to uh, to find your own confidence in and then the other part of it that maybe why I'm giving this presentation as well is I think that when you start to get into the aquatic world and you start to look into, hey, you know what, it's not just brown trout or brook trout or rainbow trout that live in these rivers, that there's lots of different fish and lots of different um, uh, um, aquatic life that, that resides in the river. And you start to really get interested in those. And, and I know myself, like it, I'll listen to podcasts about strange little bait fish species that are threatened, like red-sided dace and rainbow darters now. And um, I think a lot of that stems from the fact that I that I uh, I, I love fish through fly fishing, but um, it's really a gateway to that conservation and to that um, sort of um, environmentalism that, that really does go hand in hand with fly fishing in a lot of ways. So I think um, as I go through this presentation, that's kind of what I'm hoping to instill if uh, um, if I can maybe plant a few seeds in, in talking about these other uh, food sources for trout that a lot of people probably don't think about. So, you can so what I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about just some of the challenging different narratives. Uh, a lot of this presentation is um, primarily about large trout, uh, large trout, everyone loves catching big fish. Um, uh, what do I consider a large trout? I would just say uh, something maybe above the baseline of your average fish that you're used to seeing. Um, this isn't about trophy hunting or, or looking for that one unicorn fish. I just, I find that in my own fly fishing, I really like to... Um, 
<laughs> that's, I'm reading the comments. Sorry. Um, I really, uh, I really like to just sort of target fish. They're a little bit above average. Uh, it makes me feel good that um, catching fish that uh, that they're just a little bit above the uh, the average size that you're used to seeing. So I, I try to make decisions on what I'm doing out there to really sort of stack the odds in my favor that I could run into you know those fish that are up closer to 20 inches, upwards of 20. Hopefully, if I'm uh, having a lucky day. Um, but there's a lot of myth and mythology and a lot of rumors even surrounding the bigger fish in the river. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the narratives that you might hear and just try to challenge those a little bit. Uh, I'm going to talk about ecological niches, why those are important, a little bit of history of streamer fishing, uh, a couple of theories that are uh, rooted in biology and ecology that really guide a lot of what I'm doing out on the water day in and day out. Uh, and then I'm going to go into a little bit of detail just about some of the ways that I like to match the hatch with streamer presentations and then wrap it all up with... Uh, uh, just some of my preferred presentations for our local rivers. And then if I have time, I'll, I'll just drop a few points about some responsible angling practices as well at the very end. All right, so challenging narratives. Um, so I, I'm sure everyone out here, uh, if you spent enough time on the rivers and you're talking to some of the other anglers out there, you've probably heard one, two, maybe all of these uh, spouted off to you. So some of the things that you're going to hear are, hey, in this river, the biggest fish, they only take small flies. Uh, you need to fish ultralight tippets to catch big fish. Dry flies only catch small fish. Big trout only eat at night. You need the biggest streamers to catch the biggest fish. And big trout only eat bait fish after they reach, reach a certain size. These are all different things that you're going to hear kind of kind of thrown around a lot. I know for newer anglers, uh, this can sound like gospel. Uh, this this might even be something that, hey, a friendly angler mentioned to you that uh, maybe fishing the tailwater that you should be fishing much smaller flies, size 18 and below. I know for myself, I did that for a number of years because I I believe that was the only way to successfully fish certain watersheds. What I would say is a lot of these, they, they have some level of truth to them, um, but they're not gospel in any way, shape or form. Um, they're useful to kind of throw in the back of your head, keep as a little tip um, as to maybe how some others have found success. but um, Every one of these is both true and not true at the same time. So, uh, um, yeah, that's why I, I wanted to list those there. All right, so ecological niches. I think these are really important when it comes to understanding uh, large trout and really what they're up to most of the time. So what is an ecological niche? Well, the definition is a um, it refers to a specific role or a position that an organism occupies within its own ecosystem. So this encompasses how an organism interacts with both its living and its non-living environment. Plain speak, it's the role that an organism or a species or even an individual fish plays within its environment. So what is that fish doing to have impacts throughout its environment? Um, it's important to note that trout, they do exhibit an, ex an, an extreme amount of variability in the behavior and niche preferences, uh, depending on the environmental conditions they occur. This is what makes trout just such a successful species across the world. I think we have brown trout and rainbow trout on everywhere except for Antarctica. Um, and it's because they can really exploit the niches that are available to them. Um, a good way to just kind of oversimplify what an ecological niche might be is if you think about some of the lakes in Algonquin Park, um, predominantly we think of Algonquin Park as a brook trout and a lake trout fishery. You can have some lakes, maybe as one small lake, for example, that has uh, a brook trout um, in that lake and maybe some other fish species like uh, maybe some sticklebacks and some sculpins in that lake as well. Well, the brook trout in that lake are going to occupy the niche of being that top predator. They're the apex predator in that lake. Those, those brook trout are going to occupy the best habitat, the best rocky points, the best river mouths, uh, where all the food is, the best spawning habitat is. They're, they have the rule of the roost. Um, if you take another lake that maybe has something introduced like an invasive smallmouth bass, well, those brook trout no longer occupy that same top tier predator. Those uh, those smallmouth bass are gonna feed on the brook trout. They're gonna occupy a lot of the the, um, the best hunting grounds or the best feeding areas because they they have very similar niches, smallmouth bass and brook trout. And oftentimes smallmouth bass are going to outcompete the brook trout in that sort of uh, situation. So that, that just kind of highlights what a niche actually is. Um, so some of the factors that may affect an ecological niche that a trout finds itself uh, would be food availability. How much food is available is one of the most important factors for, for uh, trout, and especially if you're looking at a river and you're wondering, can that river support the growth of large fish? Well, you have to have food available for that fish. Uh, that food can take a number of forms, and I'm going to go through some of my favorite ones to imitate and some of the ones that I feel the big trout uh, are, are generally targeting. Um, but you have to have lots of food. That's, that's um, the first thing. The other thing is competition. So it could be competition from fish of their own species, or it could be competition from other things like smallmouth bass, pike, other fish that may uh, 
um, that may compete with uh, with the fish that maybe you're hoping to catch, which is a trout. Uh, vulnerability to predation is huge. If um, uh, if the environment doesn't allow um, uh, sort of uh, protection from predation, so if you have uh, osprey, maybe a, a bump in the osprey population and the heron population that are predating on uh, some of the some of the trout, well, then you're going to have lower numbers of trout in that watershed. Otters can do a number as well. If you have otters in your watershed, they particularly love to eat large large trout. Um, habitat structure is really, really important for, for the growth of large trout. You need good habitat, lots of um, cover and uh, uh, structure for them to hide behind, um, as well as just like nursery areas for them, for the smaller fish to hide in before they get bigger and uh, uh, can occupy some other, some other locations in the river. Uh, and a life history strategy, if you've never heard of life history, best example I can think of off the top of my head would be if you have a, um, a rainbow trout that's born into a stream, well, that rainbow trout may become a resident fish and stay in that stream for uh, the majority of its life. Whereas another life history strategy will be to migrate downstream out to a great lake or an ocean, where then that fish will spend a few years, eat a lot of food and return back as a much larger individual than that resident fish would. So they're the same fish, the genetics are the same, but the life history strategy is different. Um, rainbow trout have a very wide ranging life history, but there's 13 life history strategies, I believe for rainbow trout. Uh, so they are very wide ranging life histories uh, that they can uh, that they can utilize to ensure the success of the species. Brown trout, when I've looked it up previously, are, are a little bit below that. Brown trout are usually about nine or 10, I think, life history strategies. And then I'm not too sure about the, the different chars, like lake trout and brook trout, but just, just from some other anecdotal information, I, I suspect that they have a number of different life history strategies as well, because we see lakes in the Algonquin Park where uh, lake trout are generally very small. They're generally about 16, 18 inches. Um, those lake trout aren't getting very big, whereas other ones pop up as like 25 pound lake trout that are clearly living a completely different life than those uh, those smaller fish. So a um, couple other points on uh, what factors would uh, affect uh, the growth of large trout. Environmental conditions is huge. Climate change is having an effect on all of our trout streams. Of course, uh, warming of our rivers is a concern for uh, just about everywhere in Southern Ontario. Anybody that's fished long enough knows that uh, uh, we're, we're seeing more and more environmental changes to our rivers, more algae growth, more um, um, just uh, warming of our rivers isn't isn't doing the trout any favor. So that's a really important factor for, for understanding what niche a trout can occupy within a river. They're only going to be found in areas that can uh, support, support their uh, uh, life history strategies. So... Uh, and the last one is human impacts. Of course, us as humans have huge impacts on our trout species. That could be dams uh, restricting migration, but then you may also have things like um, a lot of angler pressure, um, or even just like um, a lot of a lot of uh, our rivers are not protected under special catch and release regulations. So you could have um, uh, over harvest occurring, and over harvest in a um, a fishery that you're hoping to find large trout is uh, is can be really affect the quality of the fishery because, of course, it takes quite a long time to grow a large trout. So if you have harvest taking place, um, it can really affect um, just the, the niches that the fish are able to utilize. Yeah. Um, I had a, a couple of uh, comments. Um, yeah. One is on the life history uh, on the rainbow trout. I didn't realize there was that many strategies that they employed. So that was that's uh, that's very interesting. But um it kind of speaks to the whole steelhead versus rainbow argument. And I mean, I've always said they're the same fish. It's just some decide to go to the lake and some decide to stay put. Yeah. Like, I think based I think on what you've heard, is that, is, do you agree with that? Yeah. I think the jury's out on that through the, uh, the genetic research that they've done. They're the same fish. So you could even have right. two as a, a mother and a father, rainbow trout yeah. that have never seen salt water or never seen a great lake they can um reproduce and their babies some of those babies may become steelhead and decide to migrate it's 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 yes. uh they're exactly the same fish from all the genetic research that has taken place on that the other the other comment i had was on the brown trout uh in terms of the range that they cover uh in a podcast i was listening to recently on actually this guy considers brown trout uh, an invasive species. Because well, they are. They, they, they are. are. They're not native to North America. I but love them, but they're his invasive. His analysis <laughs> was that brown trout now basically inhabit any water that they could possibly inhabit on the entire globe. Wow. Is now populated by brown trout. 
Wow, that's unbelievable. Well, yeah. one of the one of the comments that I make is especially uh, us here in Southern Ontario. I really try to gear this presentation towards Southern Ontario just because I feel like that's where most of the uh, listeners were going to be from. Um, right. As you hear it all the time, you know that uh, that brown trout. We we kind of have two famous brown trout rivers here uh, in Southern Ontario, but they live in a lot more than just two. Um, so yeah. if if that body of water touches the Great Lakes. Uh, there's a good chance that there could be a population of brown trout that have uh, found their home there. And mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of up to you. There's not a lot of information online. There's not a lot of information out there, but it's kind of up to you to go start exploring because uh, um, I can tell you from my own experience where I've looked, um, not everywhere, I guess, but like for the most part, when you look, you will find them. Um, they are out there. So. In, the, in, the, in the link there called The Entirely Synthetic Fish. It's a really well-written mm -hmm. book about the history of rainbow trout in North America. It's written yeah. from like a scientific angle. It's, it's actually a good read. Like I read it, I I thoroughly enjoyed it. And like, uh, you know, not just because I'm an angling nut. Yeah. yeah, no, I love it. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. We, we got rainbow trout in Costa Rica. We got rainbow trout in yeah. Hawaii. They can live anywhere. Yeah, uh, exactly. All right. So uh, I just picked a couple examples of uh, just kind of how understanding an ecological niche just might actually affect your fishing or how you can think about it or frame it uh, to what actually might be something applicable. Um, I chose brown trout. I'm obsessed with brown trout. So um, I'll be referencing brown trout a lot throughout this presentation. Uh, but if you think about just kind of three totally different river systems and just really what role or what uh, life that brown trout will lead in those um, uh, in those river systems, they're all going to be completely different. So the first example would be, you know, brown trout number one, he lives in a uh, cool headwaters of a small river, uh, competition from rainbows and brook trout. River has a very fast gradient, consists mostly of pocket water, riffles, uh, competition for food sources and prime feeding locations would be very high in a situation like that. Uh, and prime forage would consist primarily of macro invertebrates such as mayflies, caddisflies, stoneflies. This is your typical trout stream. This is the headwater stream. Um, there might even be catch and release angling uh, requirements in a, in a place like this. Maybe it sounds familiar to some of you out there. Um, a river like this, that brown trout is kind of in the typical trouty habitat, I guess, that, uh, that you would expect to find a brown trout. Um, but thing to keep in mind is competition would be very high. That fish has to work very hard uh, to sort of kind of hold its prime feeding lies um, as well as uh, uh, just kind of keep itself in the current from a lot of the, the current and the gradient in, in that river. It has to expend a lot of energy um, in the life that it lives. Uh, brown trout number two, on the other hand, lives in the main branch of a river where the characters have much more moderate gradient with deep wood strewn pools, providing lots of structure. Uh, number of trout per kilometer would be very low, and the predominant species would be something like creek chub and swamp bass. Issues with rivers like that is they need to go somewhere to find thermal refuge. Typically, those are found in springs and cold water tributaries, so there may be some migration taking place with that brown trout, and the primary forage would consist of much larger prey items like bait fish. So this brown trout, uh, this brown trout wouldn't have to compete so much with other trout species. Um, the the forage base would be large prey items, high caloric value for this fish. Um, this the difficulty, and then this trout's life would be maybe um, not biting a, a spinner or rapella thrown at it from a an angler, because generally these types of locations they're not going to have the same catch and release angling practices put in place because they're not what you generally consider to be your typical trout stream. Um, now, they also have it really hard usually in the summertime because they're going to have to go find some thermal refuge in some of those cold water tributaries. Brown trout number three, this is a brown that lives in a tailwater uh, downstream from a dam. Character of this river is a classic mix of uh, riffles, runs, and pools. Number of trout per kilometer would be very high due to annual stocking taking place. Competition for food is low due to high level of invertebrate life, such as caddis, crest bugs, which are sow bugs or isopods, and midges. So even though there's a lot of fish in this river, there's a lot of food coming down. Typically, a tailwater type of scenario breeds very, very large fish, and it's because the amount of food that's coming down through um, from the, some of the nutrients that are being released from the dam creates a high level of insect life. Those fish can get really, really big, really, really fat, and uh, often why we see really huge fish coming out of some of our tailwater systems. Um, also, there's a lot of fish going into those rivers from stocking, which also offer a lot of food to those fish as well. Um, and so those are just three examples of uh, each one of those fish is occupying a very different niche or a different role in its environment. And uh, and those impacts would really, really um, come together to to form maybe an environment that would breed certain size classes of, of, uh, of trout. So it's very simple. I mean, trout grow because they consume enough calories. They consume more calories than they're burning. 
Uh, that's how trout put out in size. Uh, and that's how they, uh, that's how they grow. So it's a constant battle for survival for these fish. Um, it's always a, um, a calculation of, um, a net energy gain basically. Um, so if they're eating enough and they're not burning more, more calories then that fish is going to grow. Um, so I, for some reason I get really interested in growth rates. Moral, you and I talked about this for a long time yesterday. <laughs> um, so this fish here is just a really interesting example. Uh, this is a 21 inch brown trout, uh, out of our river locally. And I've seen this fish uh, for three years running, and this fish was 21 inches when I caught it, and it never grew any more than 21 inches in the three years that I caught it. Um, I didn't run into this fish this year. I thought maybe it was gone. It had been uh, maybe expired um, or maybe moved on. Uh, but some other anglers uh, I found out have also caught this fish this year. And again, they, they said it was the same length, 21 inches. So that's four years running that this fish never put a single inch on. As you can see, it's a very healthy looking fish, very thick in the body. It wasn't a very emaciated fish or anything like that. Um, but I think it just maxed out its growth potential. And I think that's largely tied to where this fish lives. Um, I think the, the niche or the, or the habitat that this fish finds itself in the food source that this fish prefers i feel like it's just not able to get much much longer than that and not able to grow any any more so even though this fish was very healthy it never got any uh never changed so this fish on the other hand uh totally different story so the fit the photo on the left uh was in 2022 um caught a very i don't know generic looking um approximately 18 inch brown trout um didn't really think too much of it. I guess I decided to snap a picture of it because I think that was the only one I caught that day. Um, but nice looking brown nonetheless. But then a full 12 months later, in the exact same spot, caught the same fish again, and it had been totally transformed. Um, so the fish on the right is the same fish as the one on the left, um, but it had totally transformed shape. This fish had put on uh, at least two inches. So it was now over that threshold of 20 inches, uh, much thicker in the body, bright orange uh, flanks on it. This fish clearly is doing quite well. And so it's, it's found a food source um, and feeding and being left alone enough to really put on um, uh, some serious size. So um, I think that's a bit of a... Um, uh, an extreme example, usually when a fish gets to about 18 inches, uh, it's very hard for that fish to put on two inches per year, say, um, at least from the, some of the rivers and the, the fish that I'm familiar with. A much more average um, example that I've seen quite a bit just from catching the same fish over and over again. Um, they're only about an inch usually per year is what is typical to see in a in a healthy ecosystem. But this guy here, he, he really put the beef on and Yeah, that's a good way to tell because the spotting patterns on a brown trout are like a fingerprint. So they're, uh, they're different on every fish. And was it caught in relatively the same spot? It was caught in the exact same spot, oh, the exact current seam. Interesting. That's yeah. So, and that's common a lot of times, especially with brown trout, there are some reasons why a fish might migrate, but if their, their niche or their home has everything they need and the temperature of the water is not a factor for them to to push up into colder water springs they will stay in those locations and they don't move and they even use the same individual current seams to feed in year after year after year um it's it's phenomenal and i and i i don't want to get ahead of myself because i'm going to go into some more detail about some of that stuff but it's really amazing um sometimes where even though you're fishing some locations again and again and again and again maybe on that 50th time you go you see the same fish again so it's it's unbelievable how well they can stay hidden i had a story for uh morrow and um i can tell just briefly here where there was a fish that i um that i caught under a little undercut bank and it wasn't a very big fish it was only about 16 inches but it was the darkest brown trout i've ever seen in my life the thing was just completely copper um and it was in this really weird area and i after i caught the fish i uh i think i, I just remember thinking like no one else is um uh, fishing this little spot it just didn't look like anything but I reached under my hand under the bank and the bank went way under so it was a serious undercut so that fish was sitting under that undercut and that's also why it was so dark now fast forward that every single time I went by that little spot I threw my fly into that area without exaggerating over the next couple of years I must have fished 50 60 times never saw that fish again one random day I throw my fly back there sure enough he's there now he's 20 inches long and another under just super stunning dark dark fish um that i have no doubt that that fish is there every single time but i'm not going to see it most of the time they're very good at staying hidden so um but they're there they don't move around that much
So um, I don't want to give too much of a history in this, but uh, my presentation is primarily about streamer phishing. Um, and I just want to give a real quick run through because uh, a lot of anglers who might be a little bit newer might not just kind of realize how much newer streamer phishing is compared to other types of fly phishing. So um, from my research, what I could find was the first streamer pattern uh, created was actually by the same individual, Theodore Gordon, made famous by the Quill Gordon fly and uh, Quill Gordon wet and Quill Gordon dry, classic, classic patterns. But that's way back in the 1880s. Um, he named the fly the Bumble Puppy, which is a awesome name for a streamer. Um, I actually hadn't heard of that uh, until I started kind of looking into the, the history of streamer fishing. Um, but it was kind of like a huge wet fly. Calling it a streamer is maybe a little bit loose, but it looked it looked just like a great big uh, wet fly. Um, it, when we hit the 20s, that was really when streamer fishing took off. That's when we had the gray ghost, black ghost, uh, some of these classic um, long shank style streamer patterns, beautiful feather wings on them. Uh, these were tied by Carrie Stevens out in uh, in the main area and uh, primarily for landlocked salmon and uh, brook trout fishing. They'd actually troll a lot of these flies, which is kind of interesting that that's where that uh, uh, streamer fishing has its history. Um, fast forward to 1930s, Don Gapen's mother, Minnow, um, loved this pattern. I'd say it's just got a great affinity to this fly because it's an Ontario, uh, has its origins in Ontario for fishing the Nipigon River up in Northern Ontario for their brook trout. Um, but that was a, a game-changing pattern. Into the 60s, woolly bugger was created. Don't think I need to tell anybody what a woolly bugger is. Uh, but then just want to spend a little time on the 2000s. Is something happened in the 2000s. So this is really when I was uh, about 14 years old, really getting into fly fishing. It was starting to take hold. I was sitting there one Saturday morning, watched a uh, uh, very grainy, really poor quality version of the new fly fisher where uh, a guy named Kelly Gallup was talking about this new style of fishing. And So if you've got a 10 inch fish, he'll eat a five inch fish, 20, 10, the math continues. It's not uncommon at all to find a 25 inch fish with a 12, 13 inch rainbow, brook or brown in its stomach. Style of fishing yeah. and advertising for this book that had just come out. I think I had to beg my parents to buy this book for me. Um, book came in the mail and it was uh, the Gallup Linsenman book, um, Modern Streamers for Trophy Trout. I wasn't the only one that picked up this book at this time. This totally transformed a lot of things, uh, both in our area as well as kind of across North America um, and really brought throwing streamers targeting specifically larger trout um, kind of just to the mainstream. And uh, uh, it was a really, really important resource. And it's, to this day, it still reads awesome. I never known that I pick it up and I read a few pages and I'm like, they just nailed it. Um, and then of course, after that book came out, um, streamer fishing really got popular. Uh, and then things kind of took it an extreme. They went bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it kind of became a, a little bit of a circus with some of the silly names that streamers are being called. Uh, everybody wanted to throw meat and give their streamers uh, uh, crazy names. And everybody was coming up with their own streamer pattern. Um, but that, that's kind of where we at. were in the 2010s, I would say. So now, so now we're, what are we, 2023 here? Um, we, we've kind of hit a point where I personally feel like we're, we're entering a new, a new phase of, of streamer fishing where a lot of stuff is kind of going back to some of the old ways of fishing. You're, you hear a lot of people throwing small jig streamers now. Um, and some people are getting away from some of those articulated streamers. Well, some people are kind of even going further and further and tying crazier concoctions of feathers and fur, but, uh, that's really where we are and how we got to, to streamer fishing. But, um, I like this picture here. This is my friend holding a couple of flies I tied. Um, the the first one there is uh, uh, probably the classic line of the um, uh, baby brook trout, baby brown trout, baby rainbow trout bucktails um, that were old patterns out of the 30s. And then uh, the other one beside is just the double deceiver. So you can just see how crazy things have gotten with the, the streamer size. But um, anyway, that's where we are with streamers now. Um, and uh, just kind of another disclaimer is, especially as I get going and ranting about how I like to fish, I, I don't want to, I might sound like I'm knocking certain types of fishing. Um, I'm really not. I, I, however you enjoy fishing uh, is exactly how you should go out on the water and fish. Um, I just create kind of my own, um, I guess you could say theories and uh, uh, there, there's just certain styles that I really enjoy fishing and really give me a lot of confidence when I go out on the water. If you love throwing the absolutely massive streamers and hoping for that unicorn fish, then man, good for you. That That's great. Uh, I hope you still continue to do that. And if you hate streamers and, you know, if you think the only uh, true fly fishing is uh, a grease line and a dry fly, then that's awesome too. Uh, keep doing that. This might not be the presentation for you though. <laughs> All right. So um, 
whenever I think about streamer patterns or streamer uh, presentations, I really think it, it can be broken down into two approaches. Uh, this also is reflected in Kelly's book. Uh, while Gallup and Linson men are, are super famous and really the thing that broke the mold was uh, that those presentations to elicit an attractor or territorial response out of fish, throwing larger flies, fishing them fast, really erratic. That's what they kind of got famous for. Um, it wasn't just that within that book had lots and lots of information about imitative presentations as well. Um, but I think I just kind of refer to the Kelly Gallup method as uh, being a little bit more of a, a, an active presentation, larger flies fished on a jerk strip retrieve, which involves the rod and the the stripping of the line kind of in, in um, combination together to really get that uh, uh, erratic behavior uh, that looks like a, um, a wounded bait fish or a wounded uh, sculpin or something like that. Um, that's really what they got really, really, really popular um, with when that, that book came out. Um, and what those techniques are still super effective today, a lot of anglers, that's how they're fishing their streamers, I would say is that kind of the more common approach. Um, I think um, uh, it can be very effective at certain times of year and especially under certain water conditions um, and even for specific watersheds. Uh, I love fishing this on a bigger river where I'm just trying to cover tons of water. Really, really great way to fish. Um, if you have some color on the water um, and you're looking for those active fish and you're really uh, kind of walking the dog, ripping that fly, hitting the bags, ripping that fly back to you, um, you can get some really exciting moments fly fishing. I love to fish like that. Um, but a lot of times you notice that you're just going to get a lot of drive-bys, a lot of fish uh, flashing at the fly, not actually eating it. Um, and so uh, imitative presentations can be uh, a really good thing to switch to, or even just it's predominantly the way that I like to fish my streamer patterns um, is try to more closely resemble what the forage is that's found in the river. Um, I'll use it uh, every water that I fish. I'm, I'm very confident uh, um, in fishing a more imitative presentation to the fish when it comes to streamers. Um, it provides lots of different options for presentation styles. So whether or not I'm maybe you're an infant for the morning and I want to switch to streamers, very easy to do so when you're fishing smaller, more imitative uh, streamer patterns. Uh, you can also do it with your six weights, seven weights, uh, floating lines, sinking lines, imitative flies can be fished in a number of different ways. Um, one of the things I really like about fishing imitative patterns is that you're going to get an increased feedback from, um, from a lot of the fish. So even though... Uh, You'll catch a lot more moderate sized trout uh, with a smaller streamer, or a, a more imitative pattern. Uh, that really just does tell me that I'm, at least I'm on the right track and I'm imitating and my presentation is uh, um, kind of on point. And it lets me know what kind of water type those fish are sitting in. Whereas if I'm throwing a really huge six inch fly, it's, uh, you're gonna get less feedback from some of those smaller fish as well. Um, and I do feel you're gonna get a lot more fish eating your smaller streamer than you would a larger, more um, aggressively fished fly. Um, they're actually gonna, you're actually going to hook them and hopefully catch them, but the landing part is going to be up to you. Um, one of the things that uh, that I really like to do um, is if I'm in the mood to be fishing a more active style approach is to be fishing a larger streamer. Typically what that I'll do is that'll show you the hideouts and the locations of a lot of really big fish. I'm probably going to mention this a few times is a lot of the fish that you see popping up on these, on these slides and a lot of these, especially the brown trout, um, they're fish that I maybe saw previously on a previous outing and I've known that that fish is living there and I've gone back with much smaller streamer and more imitative streamer patterns. So um, I don't want to, I don't want to make it sound like I don't fish in this other style. I do. And I, it's really fun. And I love to do that. Um, some of the biggest trout I've caught have actually come on of just a huge streamer ripped as fast as I could. Um, but my style these days is really to go more on that imitative side. So I'll go back with a, a smaller sculpin or a, a small slump buster or something like that. All right, the non-escaping prey theory. Just want to cover a couple uh, principles that uh, I hold really close to me and that I feel like really can help um, influence what you do on the water. So the non-escaping prey theory, this came out of, I think it was Landon Mayer's book, the How to Catch the Biggest Fish, Biggest Trout in Your Life. Um, uh, also heard Trout Bitten talk about this previously as well. Uh, what this is, is it's a concept that suggests that trout, particularly large trout, they tend to target prey that is not too large or powerful um, and can escape very easily. This behavior is a result of trout's evolutionary adaption to maximize their energy intake while minimize the risk and energy uh, expenditure associated with chasing down prey. So they're looking for the big meal that comes easy. They're lazy. They don't want to. They don't want to go chase the thing that's flying across the river all the time. Um, great example is this is uh, 
last week I was in uh, British Columbia and we were fishing for bull trout um, in the in the mountains. And you have the uh, kokanee salmon that are in a lot of the pools. And you just figure like, man, there's this huge aggressive fish sitting in these pools with these uh, 12 inch kokanee salmon and uh, 12 inch white fish. Why is that fish not just hammering these fish that are, it resides in the pool? Well, you wait a lot of the while, or maybe you hook a bull trout and then it burps up a 12 inch dead kokanee. And it's because they're waiting for the ones that are dying up river to come floating down and they're actually eating the dead ones or the flesh that comes down. So they're so lazy that they're just waiting for something super easy to float by their face. And then they're going to gobble down that 12 inch fish. The other thing that happens a lot is that it could be totally dormant. And a couple of times me and a, a friend were fishing on these pools and trying so hard to get these trout to, um, these inactive trout to chase our flies and they wouldn't. If you throw a nymph on and you hook a whitefish, as soon as that whitefish starts flashing around on the end of your line, that those bull trout come in hard and they come in to try to eat that uh, that um, erratic uh, flipping around whitefish. So same thing exists with our with our other fish like rainbows and browns. Um, they're looking for that easy uh, that easy meal that's not going to get away from them. So uh, keeping that in mind, what what prey source in your rivers? Um, is easily and readily available for the fish that doesn't require them to have to do a lot of energy and a lot of work to get at it. That's a, that's a great thing to target and to, to put a lot of time into fishing. Prey image theory is just another concept, uh, and, and this isn't something that's specific to fly fishing. This is just a, uh, an ecological um, concept that exists amongst all predator species. So really, it just predicts that predators focus on a prey that are abundant within their ecosystem in which they've had previous success in hunting. Um, as those predators become adapted at spotting one potential prey item, they become worse at, at spotting other prey. So whether or not you're talking about a lion or you're talking about a brown trout, um, those fish, when they get really used to eating a, um, a specific prey item, they really focus on and they, they will be searching for or looking for um, that prey item again and again and again. I'm sure we've all had that experience where We've seen a blue and gall of hatch, tiny mayflies coming off the water. That fish is, you're watching fish gobble up all these little blue and olives, but then you also see that larger mayflies, isonychia, or maybe some big caddisflies are coming on the water. You think that bigger fish is going to want that bigger meal. So you start throwing those bigger flies over top of that fish, but yet that fish ignores everything that goes over it, except it's still eating those tiny little blue and olives. Happens all the time. It's because they're really focused on that one prey image um, that they're looking for. And the same thing goes on with um, whether when you're talking about streamer fishing, right? If you have a fish that has found that, you know, sculpins are its, uh, are its favorite food per se, it's eating sculpins all the time. And then you start throwing something that looks nothing like a sculpin and it's ripping across the top of the water. It doesn't even see that thing as food, right? So it's not, it's not in the habit of recognizing that as a food. So um, it's a very good in consideration for anybody that's going to be doing some streamer fishing um, because you can incorporate some of the triggers that certain food items have into your fly patterns. Um, so have you ever been out fishing on a very slow day and then all of a sudden it feels like every fish in the river wants to bite your, bite your fly or it's getting hooked by your fly? Reason why that is, is because you're having bite windows. Bite windows are this really interesting phenomenon that helps or that uh, that happens on the river. Um, once you learn to recognize them or, and experience them and you, and you kind of get a, hey, you know what? I'm having a really awful day and I'm not catching anything. It's not me. It's probably just the, the fish aren't on the bite. And it helps you fish through those bite windows, right? So um, you might be thinking, um, you know what, if I just keep fishing, there's supposed to be some clouds rolling in later this afternoon. Maybe the bite will pick up then. More often than not, uh, stuff like that, the bite will pick up at some point during the day. Trout, especially large trout, they need to eat often. They want to be eating. That's typically what uh, got them to become a large trout in the first place. And so um, uh, they're, they're looking for those bite windows to really start to put the feed on. They don't typically feed all day, every day, at least from, from my experience. I'm not sure if there's some um, examples of fisheries where that does occur. For the most part, and in the toughest fisheries are the ones where, you know, your bite windows may only be about 30 minutes long. Moral, you and I were talking about uh, some of the different rivers around here where, you know what, you could fish all day long and you'd swear there's not a fish in the river, but then you show up 30 minutes before dark and that's when the hatch takes place. And then all of a sudden the trout appear, right? Um, those are those bite windows and they can be driven by lots of different reasons. Uh, some of the reasons of course are going to be food availability. So that just might be the hatches are taking place at certain times. Often then you're going to get some of the large trout focusing on those hatches. That's a lot of biomass coming down. The fish get into a pattern at a certain time of year and they're recognizing that, oh, it's like ringing the dinner bell when those mayflies start going overhead. Um, water temperature can drive 
uh, bite windows as well. So maybe you have very cold water, sun comes out, hits the water, jacks the water a couple of degrees, all of a sudden the bite window's on. Other things like water levels, so increased precipitation causing the water levels to rise will trigger a bite window a lot of times. That's a pretty typical one a lot of people have experience with. Light levels, especially when I'm talking about brown trout, that can really, really affect your bite windows. So fishing during periods of low light. And then uh, kind of the more complicated ones um, are the barometric pressure changes and solar lunar phases. Um, a lot of theories exist out there. I'm not going to go into them here because to be honest, I don't have a lot of evidence to say um, how barometric pressure uh, affects fish. Hard changes, like I, I think about my own experience and the amount of time I spent on the water. I generally don't have great fishing when it's super windy out. And I think that's because of a lot of the pressure changes that are taking place. Um, I still stay out there and fish through them anyway, because there's always the off chance that something could happen. So, but yeah. um, you really, you really do become a believer. I, I feel so strongly about bite windows. I've seen tons of them take place where there's no other explanation other than something changed and the fish turned on. Um, I notice it a lot with brown trout. Uh, so if you have some close angling friends and, you know, they're, uh, they're out there fishing all the time and maybe they're having really good fishing, uh, uh, during certain conditions and you have a open network of, uh, information exchange and they're saying, Hey man, the, the bite window right now is, uh, at 2 PM. Oh, 2 PM rolls around. That's when the bite window is, uh, go out there and have a look. Cause, uh, you might, you might notice that you can even last for a couple of days, um, the, the flip side of that is they can also change in an instant where I've chased a lot of bite windows reported to me they just, just haven't worked out <laughs> all right so kind of into the the meat of the presentation here so matching the hatch with your streamers um i do think that using appropriately sized streamers to mimic the natural forage that the larger trout are looking for um that it's very effective for several reasons first and foremost you're just going to be matching what's already in the water and the what the fish are already eating uh, but you get some added benefits as well such as you get a very subtle presentation a lot of the time it's not a big streamer crashing down on their head um, so in various water conditions where that may not be desirable um, you're going to get that added benefit as well as a lot of the uh, fly patterns i'm going to show you uh, they have very natural movements and they're also very versatile so you can use them in lots of different watersheds for lots of different fish I talk about brown trout a lot but it's not just for brown trout all these will work for um for brook trout rainbow trout no matter where you're fishing um i do think though that like by matching the hatch with your streamers um and combining that non-escaping prey theory that i talked about that prey image theory so giving them the silhouette and the and adding some triggers to your flies that uh will will signal to that fish that this is a familiar food item to it. And then maybe heading out there when those bite windows are on, those are kind of the three things that if you can do those things, I think is a very good formula for uh, really kind of really putting the odds in your favor of running into a larger fish that day. Most common sculpins we have here are the mottled sculpin and the slimy sculpin. They're little bait fish that live down near the substrate of the river, and they're really not the best swimmers, even though they're a little fish that lives in, in rivers. Uh, they don't have a swim bladder, so when they get dislodged from the bottom, they have a really hard time finding their way back down to their homes. Uh, they're usually an ambush predator, so they're sort of sitting on the bottom, coming up and grabbing little insects as they come through. Um, but it's very easy for them to get dislodged, and they're a really lovely little piece of protein for a large trout to eat. Um, one little tip that I'd, uh, I'd picked up, um, the size of the substrate can provide clues to the size of the sculpin. So if you have very, very small rocks and small boulders or small uh, stones in the bottom of your river, the sculpins are going to be generally a lot smaller. Whereas if you get really large rocks and large boulders in, uh, in your river, uh, the sculpins will reflect that and they'll actually be a lot larger, um, likely because there's lots more habitat for them to be hiding in. So I kind of have three things that I think about whenever I'm thinking about imitating any kind of bait fish or any kind of um, um, uh, food source for trout. Uh, and that's profile and size, weight and color. And you'll hear me kind of talk about that uh, as I go through the different food sources. Uh, but I think with sculpin, the most important thing really is that profile. So it's just absolutely critical to match the size of the natural. Um, and then of course, focusing on that great big large head of a sculpin, tapering it down to a smaller body. Um, the other thing with a sculpin is a lot of sculpin patterns are absolutely huge. You see huge articulated sculpins being thrown around now. I have a I have a tendency to believe that those may not be taken by the fish as actual sculpins, and they may be more reflective of larger bait fish or even small trout, um, especially when you hear a lot of the olivey, yellowy, browny colors um, that these flies are, are being tied in. Um, I think that a lot of those are likely imitating smaller smaller trout species because most sculpins, like the model sculpin and the slimy sculpin here in Ontario, they're actually they're smaller than three inches. Um, they're actually not that big. Um, now, when I'm tying them, I tie them uh, either really, really heavy or I tie them relatively light. Um, the reason why is because 
when I'm tying them really heavy, I want to get down to the bottom. I'm using things like sculpin helmets, which gave a great profile, um, beads, cone heads, tungsten beads, tungsten cone heads, really to drive those sculpins down. And that's going to be more of a jigging action on that fly. Uh, but then I've never gotten away from the old deer hair sculpin. I think the deer hair sculpin is just, A, it's traditional, and B, I love the way that it looks and the profile I can get. I can get a great big broad profile on that fly, and it pushes a lot of water. Uh, so those are flies like uh, Zoo Cougars, Whitlock's Matuka sculpin. These are great patterns for imitating them. Those are generally going to be more lightly weighted, and I'm typically going to be fishing those um, in the, some of the slower pools that uh, I don't need to drop that sculpin right down into. Color when it comes to sculpin, now it varies very widely depending on the environment. You can have sculpins that are in your olives, tans, and browns. Uh, I very much believe that matching the bottom is a good practice. So if you have a river that has a very sandy bottom, you're going to be fishing more of a tan colored sculpin, uh, whereas a lot of our other rivers, um, olive to brown is a much more uh, reflective of where you're, of the coloration that you're going to find in those sculpins. Now, when I'm talking about triggers, I really like a little bit of orange in those patterns, a uh, little orange fit, and that's to replicate the uh, the large pectoral fins on the sculpins. So adding a little bit of an orange coloration to your sculpins is something I do on every single one of my flies usually. And um, that really just kind of gives that fish, maybe it's like a hot spot on a, on a nymph, but uh, I think it's a trigger that they're looking for. And um, uh, typically I'm throwing those on a five weight. That's right, at, most common rod I fish these days is a five weight. Previously, it was a four. I've bumped it up to a five weight now, and um, I'll, I have a little section on some of the uh, gear that I fish and sort of why I do that. But uh, if I'm tight lining, it's going to be either a four or a five weight. Um, when I'm fishing something like, say, a, uh, a big deer hair headed sculpin, uh, it's generally going to be on something like a six or a seven weight. Yeah, so th there's just like two favorites right there, uh, both in an olive coloration. It, first one there is just an absolute deadly pattern. It's super simple. Um, it's a bunny sculpin. It's rabbit fur with a big sculpin head on the end of it. So um, you can see the orange little colorations that I have in there. Um, that That's a one that I never leave home without. Uh, the other one there is a, a Whitlock Matuka sculpin, much more involved tie. I love tying them. They work really, really, really well as well. So, um, but yeah, much, much more involved tie. A lot more effort to sink that fly. It's not going to drop into the pockets like, say, the fly on the left will. Um, so if I'm fishing that fly, it's generally in a much slower uh, speed water because um, then I'm just I'm relying more on the action that that deer hair is going to give me. Darters. So darters are, they kind of get missed a lot of the time. Um, darters are present in, again, just like sculpins in almost all of our rivers. Um, they're all throughout our, our environment, especially in some of the small creeks and streams. Uh, they're actually a member of the perch family. Uh, and some of the species of darter are known for just really crazy, vibrant colors. Uh, several species are found in Ontario, like Johnny darter, rainbow darter. Uh, we also got fantail darters and sand darters, and there's just, you can go down a wormhole of the different darter species that we have. Uh, they're typically found in a sandy gravel or smaller substrate. Uh, usually we'll see them if you're walking through the shallows and you're looking down into the water and you see these little tiny minnows darting every which direction. Those are your darters. Um, they are very similar to sculpins in that they usually do reside close to the, the substrate and they're down near the bottom, uh, but they're much less robust and so they don't have that great big giant head like a sculpin would and they're much more streamlined. So uh, that example there, that's actually a log perch, I believe. Um, uh, and you can see just like the orange fins that are showing up on that is the olive barred coloration that probably looks like a lot of streamers that you have in your box. Um, so that was found on one of our local rivers. I was kicking around the rocks and dug up that one and had pretty much the perfect fly to imitate it. So um, yeah, that's just a slump buster next to it. So I really have this like affinity to darters and I tie a lot of flies to imitate them. Um, they are small streamlined bay fish. They have less pronounced fat head than sculpins, like I was saying, but they're also often very small as well. They're not a, a huge minnow. Uh, typically that's going to be less than three inches. Uh, whenever I'm tying flies to imitate them, I like a tungsten bead on them, but I don't want this really heavy anchored bead. Um, I want to really get lots of little jig flips and uh, head flips and stuff like that out of the uh, out of the fly. So I'm typically using something like say a four mil tungsten bead on the end of it. That seems to be perfect because I have a great big marabou tail behind a lot of them. And uh, that, that gets me down where I need to be but also doesn't just like drop the thing like a really heavy sculpin helmet might. Um, the color of darters, well, it very much varies across species. Uh, as a general rule, you should match the uh, the bottom, like I was saying. Uh, a lot of darters can be quite tan in coloration, so they're a lot very light color. Um, but then like the one you saw previously, they, they can be quite olive as well. Um, I like very light color, light olive colored um, uh, imitations is typically what I'm fishing. But then you can get these really crazy rainbow darters, which if you've never seen a rainbow darter, do yourself a favor and Google rainbow darter. They're one of the most beautiful fish that live in our rivers, um, and they're fluorescent green and blue and they're they're, they're beautiful uh, so the one on the left i just call it nick's darter fly that's probably 
top five patterns for me. Um, it's a small jig streamer, uh, very light olive colored uh, marabou tail, like a woolly bugger, a little bit of orange, and then some ice dub on the head to give it just a little bit of iridescence, kind of like the rainbow darters that uh, that you can find. Uh, the pattern on the right is just your typical slump buster. Again, it's tied on a jig hook, but that really doesn't matter. Tied on a cone, tied on a jig, they fish the same way. Um, but I just try to get that sort of slim profile like you would out of a zonker or a slump buster. And uh, and th those are just seriously some of my, my favorite flies. They're not they're not overly complicated. They're not um, very hard to tie. If you lose them, you don't cry the blues. Uh, they work incredibly well on a lot of our fish. Um, just simple ties. Rabbit and marabou. Can't beat it. So suckers, dace, and chub. These are a little different. Um, these are also found in all of our uh, a lot of our rivers. Um, super common, and they do serve as a significant food source for our fish. Uh, suckers, they were once thought to be undesirable, but they do make an important part of the ecosystem. Uh, suckers, they sucker eggs can be a big part of a trout's diet. Sucker fry can be a big part of a trout's diet, and then the juveniles are also an important for, uh, part of a uh, resident trout's diet when they're on the bait fish. Dace are a little different; they're much smaller. They have a much more slender appearance, and they do inhabit the cold water streams. Um, often, you can have red-sided dace and black-nosed dace, so the the, the species that we have around here. Uh, creek chub are, are much larger than dace, uh, and they can inhabit a wide range of environment. Uh, they can often be found in some of those slower, more warmer sections of river. I'm sure we've all had it when maybe you've been nymphing or something like that in a slow, slow creek and the creek chub just won't stay off your nymphs. Um, that's a good sign that, uh, you know, there might be some larger fish uh, predating on the, the creek chub. How to imitate these? Well, they're going to be thin to moderate size, or sorry, thin to moderate uh, proportion bodies. Suckers and chub imitations, these can be huge. You can tie them up to six inches, go bigger if you want to. Um, my own personal preference is I don't really tie streamers any larger than six inches. That's about as big as I'll go. Um, dace, much smaller than your, your chub and your suckers. They can be um, uh, red-sided dace and black-nosed dace. Usually they're only about two inches long, so they're not a very big, big, uh, uh, big minnow. Um, again, as far as weighting is concerned, uh, when I'm talking about dace and chub, I'm usually going a little lighter. Uh, I like a lot of weighted streamers because I am typically fishing either a mono rig or a floating line um, on the, on the, for the majority of time. Uh, so I do like a little bit of weight just to bring that fly down below the surface, uh, but I don't want too much that it imparts too much dead weight and I can't get some action out of the fly. If you put too much weight on your flies, they're only going to go like this in the water. They're just going to do those S patterns. If you can have the proper amount of weight that that fly can still get some side to side movement when you're when you're flicking your rod tip or stripping your line, then uh, I think that really results in a lot more takes out of the fish because it's just not that one plane of action. You get multiple planes of action going on. Um, my one exception to that is with sculpins. Sometimes I want a sculpin to just anchor itself right down to the bottom. Uh, same thing with sucker imitations. They're down near the bottom as well. I want to drag some huge streamer down near the bottom and see if there's a big gnarly brown down there. Uh, something in a sucker coloration, so tans, golds, browns, uh, that's really heavily weighted is generally what I'm going to fish. Um, just so I don't repeat myself so much is that whenever I'm talking about bay fish imitations, one of my uh, real strong triggers or real strong feelings towards patterns is I hate... Um, uh, monocolored streamers. I really like a combination or, or blends of coloration on the streamers because when you look at an actual bait fish, uh, they usually have a really dark top and a light bottom. I try to incorporate that in as many ways as possible. If I'm not doing dark top, light bottom, often what I'll do is a dark head, light abdomen or whatever of the streamer. So I like the I like the kind of blends of the colors. I feel like it's more reflective of the natural uh, bait fish. Now, when it comes to adding flash to your fly patterns, uh, I think a lot of streamers out there have far too much flash on them. Um, I sort of do an all or nothing approach where either I'm fishing an extremely flashy fly, like I'll do for the dace and the chub and the suckers um, and some of the patterns that I think might be representing those. Whereas with the sculpins and the darters, I don't put too much flash. I don't really like any on my sculpin patterns at all. I go totally flashless sculpins because they're very muted down um, pattern. And it really, and it gives me an options as well. Cause some days I feel like the flash, they're just not on it. Um, other days, super flashy flies are getting all the strikes. So um, if I'm tying flies for minnow species like dace and chub and stuff, I, I go all out of the flash. I put tons of it. This is a good example here. So this is a uh, big fat 20 some odd inch female brown. Um, I actually caught this fish on a relatively large five inch streamer. Um, this fish, as soon as it hit my net, it coughed up a much larger uh, baby sucker that it had engulfed prior to eating my big streamer. So um, these fish are definitely eating big suckers um, at certain times of year, certain conditions. And uh, yeah, I was kind of excited when I saw the head on the of the regurgitated middle because if clear as day it was a sucker right <laughs> but uh yeah they're definitely eating some big prey from time to time 
Yeah. Um, so Sucker Imitation, uh, this is just another streamer that I really like. It's the Flash Monkey. Um, uh, it's a Russ Madden pattern. Lots and lots of action on it. Kind of the right amount of weight. It has double B-chain eyes on it, so it's enough to sink that fly. But that big head on it and the uh, articulated tail will really swing around and dance like crazy. So, And that's just to show you kind of the colorations in a Sucker uh, pattern. Golds, coppers, browns, tans, dark back, light body. Um the other one on the other side is just a, it's basically a zonker style fly pattern with a fish skull rammed on the front of it. Uh, that, that fly there, it's a, a pretty good, pretty good staple fly. And that's just had in a, a red sided dace coloration. So that's why the red sides on it, uh, generally a tan uh, and cream uh, colored uh, uh, minnow. So that, that's a red sided dace pattern there. So the cannibal trout, I think it's really important to talk about uh, just the cannibalistic behaviors of fish. Uh, the cannibalism among trout, where one trout preys on another and consumes another trout, it can, can occur under certain conditions, uh, and it's frequently observed. Uh, cannibalism is more likely in situations where competition for resources is very intense. So when you have a lot of different trout that are uh, vying for, uh, for food, um, or when alternative food sources are very limited. Uh, so in your marginal waters where there might not be a lot of food source available to the fish, they turn to eating their own. Um, in a healthy trout population with abundant natural prey, cannibalism may be less common. I think brown trout especially have a tendency to, to cannibalize. Uh, I know lake trout do as well, um, but all trout do it to some extent. So fishing um, baby trout imitations is uh, another just huge confidence uh, for me. I try to mimic a lot of the uh, streamers I tie are tied in just different trout colorations. When you think about the rivers that we have here, um, we have rivers that are heavily influenced by Great Lakes steelhead. That means that you're going to have young of the year steelhead just jam packed into those rivers. If you're trying to target things like resident rainbow trout, brown trout, and brook trout, they're going to be feeding on those baby steelhead. We have rivers here that are stocked like crazy with baby Atlantics, um, as well as baby brown trout on some fisheries. Those larger fish are going to be targeting those smaller versions of. Uh, of their uh other cousins let's just say so um i do think we can uh imitate those and that's a very good niche for a very large trout to be focused on um how do i imitate them well they are, have a moderate to thick body bait fish patterns um the size range it changes throughout the year especially if you're talking about something like a steelhead that might be like a little tiny fry earlier in the spring and then grow to be uh, a couple inches long by the time the fall comes around um, but my preference for Im imitating baby trout is usually to stick around that four to five inch range. I don't really go much bigger than that. Um, I know when they stock the grand, say that they're, they're putting like eight, eight inch stalkers in there. I know some guys fish slides that big, but, um, I, I still stick at that four to five inch. It's just kind of a confidence, uh, size range for myself. Um, again, I like them lightly weighted for the most part. Typically I'm using something like a dumbbell eye or a brass fish skull on the end of the fly. Um, or sometimes I'll even tie them with no weight at all. And I'm fishing that full sinking line or sink tip line to really exaggerate the actions on those, um, on those patterns. Now, again, trying to stick with my theme here. I like contrasting colors, uh, typically light on top, dark on bottom, but I'm always adding like different cheeks to the flies as well. I think those can serve as a bit of a trigger. Uh, there's one river I fish that uh, has a lot of brook trout in it. We feel like the, uh, some of the brown trout in there are definitely targeting the brook trout. And uh, by adding uh, a little bit of orange in there, to be a dark olive or a darker color um, back on it, a little bit of white belly and a nice orange cheek. I feel like they're eating that fly as a uh, as a baby brook trout, and it works very well. Um, same thing when I'm talking about brown trout, maybe a little yellow on the cheeks, and of course rainbows have those bright pink cheeks on them that uh, can serve as a bit of a trigger. Maybe it's a hot spot. Maybe it's just for me. I'm not sure, uh, but I think uh, those definitely function as a bit of a trigger for those fish especially when I'm building on that like prey image theory, like I'm, I was talking about earlier. They, uh, so there's one there that's a uh, fly on the left there. Um, that's a double bunny fish skull type imitation uh, for a stocked brown trout or maybe even a stocked Atlantic salmon works extremely well. A lot of times the stocked fish, they have a much more muted and toned down color than maybe some of the wild naturals. Um, so if you ever caught a freshly stocked fish in the Grand River, you'll see that it's very gray free, like not a lot of color on it. Right. So that's really what that fly is imitating. Whereas the fly on the right, uh, it's actually Kelly Gallup's boogeyman. Man, streamer that fly there has got the yellows in it i feel like that's more reminiscent of maybe a wild brown trout but should you get into that level of detail probably not but uh throwing something that uh, uh as close as you can to resemble what maybe the fish is feeding on is a um uh i don't know i think it's a good strategy uh the baby trout in my dad's hand there that's just a little rainbow that we caught in a little uh uh great lakes um river where there is a res resident brown trout population in that in that river and uh, the river is absolutely loaded. This was, I believe this was in, oh, it was this 
early September, I believe. Um, so the steelhead population lot, laid lots of eggs in the spring. Uh, by this point, the um, the river is just completely packed full of young steelhead of about this size. So you can bet that the resident brown trout that they're feeding on these like crazy. There's, there's hunters in them. Now crayfish. So moving a little bit away from bait fish, uh, some of the other food sources that I, I think uh, crayfish are very overlooked um, food source for a lot of trout. Um, a lot of fisheries uh, and a lot has been written, I think, relatively recently about uh, just how important crayfish can be, especially on rivers like uh, out in New York, um, on the West Branch of the Delaware. Crayfish just seem to be the number one food source for a lot of their uh, uh, large trout population. Um, I when I when I started reading about how effective crayfish flies were for large trout, I I went absolutely crazy fishing crayfish flies. Um, mixed results at best. Um, I know some rivers that we have here, uh, crayfish may make up a very large uh, source of protein and a food source for or become even the primary food source for a lot of the fish. Um, but some of our rivers, I know the ones that Mauro and I both fish more frequently. We haven't had a lot of success fishing uh, some of the very specific crayfish flies. Um, so these are the ones that, you know, kind of look more like a small bass with the big small bass pattern with like the big, big claws on them and things. Haven't had a lot of success on those. Um, usually, well, kind of get ahead of myself, but uh, the, the types of imitations that I that I prefer for at least trail fishing is something more reminiscent of a woolly bugger. Um, but crayfish are in our rivers. Uh, we have both invasive and native crayfish, and they are definitely an essential component to uh, our trout ecosystems. I think they might play an essential role in the warmer months of providing a food source. So um, crayfish, they may not be available through the uh, winter and early spring because they're going to be down deep in the mud, hibernating, very, very low activity. Um, but as that water warms and that um, uh, those crayfish begin to molt and become more active and feed and grow. Uh, I think that's really when the crayfish likely provides a much um, uh, more important food source for those fish. They are most active during periods of low light, um, and then they're highly vulnerable to trout as that water warms and they begin to molt. And so I've heard a lot of anglers, a lot of really um, um, even local anglers describe um, fish on the hunt for molten crayfish. Um, so there'd be a lot lighter coloration than say uh, the darker one that's on my rod here. Now crayfish, I think one of the biggest mistakes when you're imitating crayfish is to fish a very thin uh, crayfish pattern. Um, I like something that's very robust, especially in the body. When you see crayfish swimming, they look like little little war tanks or whatever swimming around the rivers. Um, they tuck their claws together. So the claws actually don't make up a large uh, silhouette on the actual crayfish. Um, so small marabou tails, small rabbit strips, uh, squirrel even would be a great way to do so. Um, but I think the claws on a lot of different crayfish patterns are very over-exaggerated. Um, focusing more on just kind of creating that thick profile in the body is just a much, uh, I've had much more success uh, doing that. Um, and then also a lot of crayfish flies are really big, they're really huge. Um, a lot of the crayfish that you find in the river, they're going to be sub three inches. So sticking around that size is a little bit more natural to the fish. Um, generally speaking, I like a crayfish fly to be quite heavy. So I'm usually using things like cones, beads, lead eyes, uh, something to weight that fly down. Um, and then as far as color is concerned, going to be fishing in your matching the bottom colors again. So olives, rusty browns, tans, some of them can be quite light gray. And then some of the triggers that you can incorporate into your patterns are the orange tip claws. So a little flex of orange like that a lot in a crayfish fly. Um, like as you can see there, the one on the left, that's really just a woolly bugger. It's just a beefed up woolly bugger, if anything. Uh, there's some rubber legs thrown on there and there's some shellapin type hackle on it, but I uh, got the orange going on. Um, that fly there works very, very well. Uh, fly on the right is a pheasant bugger. That's a Gunner Brammer fly, um, super simple type bugger. Um, I think that's a perfect little crayfish pattern. Um, again, the claws, not the predominant feature on these patterns. I think uh, I think that just creates a better silhouette going on about that prey image theory again they're looking for that really thick bodied um uh, morsel that's kind of swimming around in an erratic action down near the bottom most likely and those claws are tucked way in when the crayfish is swimming so they don't actually have great big claws sticking way out at the sides when that thing is swimming so i think both these patterns you could just use your run-of-the-mill woolly bugger can't really beat it for a uh, for a crayfish imitation but uh um yeah it's really fun to fish them so a couple other items here. You might not think about these things when we're thinking about uh, trout foods, right? We're always thinking about stoneflies, um, 
mayflies, caddisflies, that kind of thing. But uh, there's worms in our rivers, lots and lots of worms. You can have both terrestrial, aquatic worms. These are favorite food items for trout. They're constantly looking for worms. They're there all year round. And again, when we're talking about that non-escaping prey theory, big trout love stuff that can't swim away from them. And once that worm is in the drift, you can bet that's going to go by. If that goes by the, the nose of a large trout, it's going to be eating it. Um, same thing goes with leeches. Leeches are a little better at swimming than, say, a worm. Uh, but leeches love... Um, uh, uh, or sorry, trout love to eat leeches. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with fishing leeches uh, to a lot of our brown trout streams around here. I know that for anglers out in the Colorado area, uh, targeting large fish, Landon Mayer, for example, he he talks a lot about uh, fishing leech patterns as being a, uh, a super successful way to target large trout. Um, but where I do find leeches work extremely well uh, is in a lot of the areas of Algonquin Park. There's an insane amount of leeches um, in that in those rivers and uh, lakes around there. Um, great way to know is if if you have have leeches and a really great way to kind of find any sort of um, uh, forage base that maybe your fish are feeding on is to go out at night, shine your lights into the water and see what you see swimming around. Uh, typically leeches come out um, after it's dark out and you'll see really big leeches in most of the lakes in Algonquin Park and those brook trout up there, that's, that's a huge food source for them. So um, leeches are a really good uh, uh, thing to imitate if you're up there fishing them. Um, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of spitballing here, uh, but more, you and I were talking about this yesterday. Lampreys are present in our rivers here. We have the Northern Brook lamprey in a lot of our water and a lot of our rivers here. Um, maybe some of you have been out on our local rivers and you've seen them spawning in the spring. Uh, they offer a huge protein source for these fish. And I have no doubt in my mind that the fish are targeting these, uh, Northern Brook lamprey when they're, uh, when they're doing their spawning activities. Cause you'll see like hundreds of them on certain, uh, certain little fine gravel and sand, uh, uh, sandy areas. So imitating the lamprey can be a really good way to, to target those larger fish. Um, they aren't that big. The maximum size that they'll get is usually around six inches. So they're not a great big long. I'm not talking about the invasive one that, uh, that does a number of our lake trout populations in the Great Lakes. These are a native lamprey species that are just there in the river. Um, I've caught them in my net before going around trying to, you know, pick one up or kicking over rocks every now and then one's up ends up in my net um but that that's just kind of like a hidden food source that not a lot of anglers up there are imitating um when it comes to some of our um, food source for large fish all right so um getting into uh just sort of the even the bugs um that can be imitated with streamers i know that uh uh, some of the really large uh, insects are just perfectly effective way uh, or imitated by um, very large um, or for, sorry very small streamer patterns um, you could have your hexagenias and burling mayfly nymphs you know tan woolly buggers and uh, there's a pattern in the next slide there about um, it's called the um, uh, the full motion hex or the the posy bugger those are great flies for imitating uh, some of the burling mayfly nymphs and i've had a lot of success doing that especially with the uh, the green drake um, hatch uh, on some of our wa local waters uh, fishing those before the hatch the fish are looking for them Again, they're looking for certain things at uh, certain times of year. Um, using small streamers to imitate those is a really good way to make sure that uh, um, you're putting uh, what the fish are kind of looking for in front of them. Stoneflies as well. Uh, well, more of a nymph for, for sure. Um, I love tying really big stonefly nymphs and drifting those around. They're available year round to the fish. It's hard to go wrong with a big stonefly nymph. And then even helger mites. I know um, um, me and Matt Martin, uh, guide, uh, Southern Ontario guide, we're out fishing one day and we're kicking over so many rocks and having a look around. We just found helger mites absolutely everywhere. And uh, it's without a doubt that the, the helger mite or dobson fly larva is consumed um, by some of those fish. And really, you can't beat a black woolly bugger, right? Black woolly bugger will imitate so many different things, including those uh, those dobson fly larva. And uh, I mean, I don't think I've ever gone to the river without a black woolly bugger in my box because um, it's just such a deadly, a deadly effect to fly. Um, so yeah, just a couple other things to throw into your mind about what might, the fish might actually be eating out there. Um, what we have there is a hexagenia nymph on my rod. So that's a very large burrowing mayfly nymph. Um, it was found on a local river here. Um, and then I have the imitation on the other side there. So that's a small streamer fly, uh, not too much difference than, uh, than your average woolly bugger really. Um, but using streamers to imitate nymphs is something that's often overlooked. Uh, a lot of the nymphing now it's done with, uh, smaller, uh, paradigons and, um, uh, a lot of the different color uh, Euro nymphs to, to imitate. And that's what we think of as nymphs now, but some of these larger streamers can actually be fished as a nymph imitation as well. 
So one quick comment here, just about uh, some night fishing. I, I can't do a presentation about targeting large fish without at least talking a little bit about night fishing. Um, now it's not for everybody. Night fishing is, um, it's definitely uh, something that a lot of people talk about and not a lot of people do for good reason. It takes a, it takes a little bit of um, getting used to, let's just put it that way. Um, but large trout do have a habit or and large trout especially have a, um, they may find a niche within feeding at night. Um, and so, what those fish will do, um, is particularly when we're talking about brown trout, is they might not be feeding during daylight hours for a number of different reasons. They may have found a food source that's available to them uh, under the cover of darkness, and they're going to exploit that food source. Uh, so there's a lot of myth and mythology around night fishing that, you know, the biggest fish come out at night and stuff like that. From my own personal experience, that's not true. You can catch very large fish at night, absolutely. Uh, but you can also catch lots of small fish at night as well, uh, depending on what you're doing. Night fishing is kind of, uh, totally just takes fly fishing, flips it on its head. Um, night fishing uh, pattern becomes a little bit less important. Obviously, the fish aren't really seeing much. I think that uh, understanding the lateral line and how a fish would find the food is really important. Uh, going out there and fishing the same way that you do during the daytime may not be so effective. So going out, finding the slower water and using a fly that creates a bit of a wake on the surface, a little bit of surface disturbance. If you're fishing dry flies, dry flies that sort of splat down on the water, cause a little bit of a disturbance on the water, or maybe you're fishing something like a... Um, some kind of a streamer or a mouse fly that causes a wake or a disturbance on the surface that just allows that fish to find your fly um, is a really, really good strategy for fishing these at night. Um, I don't want to get too far into the night stuff because I mean, I could probably do a whole presentation on night fishing, but um, uh, generally speaking, we're, we're going to be fishing flies that are up near the surface. The reason why is because fish look up at nighttime uh, and they, they use the, um, if there's any kind of moonlight, they're looking for the silhouette that passes over their head. Um, and so a lot of the flies that we're using and the kind of the exciting thing is that you get to fish them on the surface, uh, at least under uh, most conditions, that's probably what you're looking to be doing. Um, there's also uh, the ability to uh, catch them on mouse flies, which a lot of anglers love to fish mouse flies. Uh, I could talk your ear off again about uh, just kind of the mousing obsession. My own personal view is that the fish aren't necessarily eating a lot of mice. It's just that a mouse fly creates a big silhouette. It's waking across the surface. Are they eating it as a mouse? Maybe. Are they eating it as a frog? Maybe. Are they eating it as just something that looks like food to them? That's more along the lines of how I'm thinking. Uh, a lot of the fish that I've caught at night, they haven't actually come on mouse flies. They've come on just larger streamer presentations uh, that are up near the surface of the water. So I don't think it, mousing is sort of the, the key to unlock everything about night fishing. The fish are still looking for a variety of different foods at night. It's just that they're really relying on that lateral line system that they have um, and finding the right water to be fishing at night is also really key. So if you're fishing heavy turbulent waters, it's generally hard to get the proper presentations in those. You're generally gonna be looking for the slower pools, the tailouts and the, um, uh, the water where that lateral line uh, uh, can really allow that fish to find your fly uh, because it's dark and they can't see it. So they're they're relying on their other senses. But um, night fishing is pretty fun. Um, if you're into that kind of thing, um, you can catch nice fish at night. If you want to uh, the one comment I really wanted to make about night fishing is just because I was talking about um, some of the ecological niches the trout will occupy is that definitely one is feeding at nighttime. That That's a, a niche that a lot of trout um, will, will use to exploit um, and to, to feed. And uh, this particular fish, um, I caught this fish two times. Um, I've had him strike far more than two times um, on various evenings. And uh, it was a really beautiful brown trout. It had lots of big, beautiful spots on it. Um, I really wanted to catch this fish during the day. I tried very, very hard to catch this fish during the day. I returned over and over and over again to try to catch this fish during the day, but I never even saw a glimpse of it. But then you return at night and here he was sitting in the exact same spot, night after night. This is where he fed and this is when he fed. I couldn't change it, even though I wanted to photograph this fish in the daylight and get a beautiful photo of all the beautiful spots he had, I couldn't make it happen. And so what I'm trying to tell you is that a lot of these fish, they develop these certain patterns and these certain behaviors. Maybe this fish was so large because he fed at night and nobody ever bothered him and he could feed out in the open as much as he wanted. I'm not sure if that by feeding at night is what caused him to get large or if he got large because he fed at night. I don't know. It's kind of a chicken before the egg type of situation. So presentations, we can't, we talk so much about flies and stuff like that. Um, that's really the fun stuff. I love getting into the nitty gritty on the flies, but um, I mean, presentation is just far more important. Uh, in today's day and age, really the industry trend is to 
to really gear towards specific gear for specific presentations. So, I mean, I've seen anglers out there carrying three rods on the river. Personally, that's not for me. I, I don't want to be juggling different rods on the river. I'm more of a generalist. I love to fish streamers. I'd say, especially as of late, it's kind of my predominant way of fishing. Um, but I'm, I am not adverse to throwing on a nymph or well, hopefully I'm both the entire time I'm fishing. I'm usually hoping for a dry fly hatch as well. So I like to be able to bounce between uh, all different styles of fishing. Usually what I'll do is I'll use a, a nine and a half foot five weight. It's kind of the rod I've sort of settled on, um, at least for, for right now. Previous to that, I was fishing a 10 foot four weight. A lot of the time is my, my rod of choice. If I know I'm going to go out there and I'm going to just throw huge streamers all day, because I don't know, I'm targeting um, the biggest fish in the water system. I want to cover tons of water. I have sinking lines or something like that. Uh, I'm going to maybe opt for a six or a seven weight fly rod. Uh, but for the most part, I'm fishing a nine and a half foot five weight. Um, I think the presentations that I'm choosing to fish, they're going to be dictated on two different factors, the water type that I think I'm going to be fishing that day, and really just how I feel, what I feel like doing that day. So that's usually kind of the two things that uh, factor into it. So the monorig, um, if you're not familiar with the monorig, uh, I personally believe that you should be. Uh, some individuals uh, may feel that this is not exactly fly fishing because it involves a very long leader of uh, usually something like a like uh, some kind of monofilament like Maxima chameleon. This is very similar to what you hear a lot of people describing as Euro nymphing. Um, but I love to fish streamers on this style. Uh, what this really does is it gives you very precise control uh, over where your streamer is located. Uh, you get very precision casting. You're able to land your little streamer or your large streamer into little pockets and little nooks and crannies and really kind of um, uh, kind of go after where you think those fish might be holding. Uh, you get an added strike detection because you're tight and you have contact with that, uh, with that fly. Uh, so when that fish eats, you're already pretty tight to it. Uh, you're not going to miss too many strikes, hopefully. Uh, you can vary your presentations. You can do all kinds of different things with the monorig. Um, if you're not familiar with the monorig, go check out Trout Bitten website. Dominic goes into so much detail about the mono rig. I think there's just like 50 articles on it um, and how you can switch from dry fly to, to nymphing to streamer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but just so you guys have a little bit of a background, this is often how I am fishing, uh, especially when I'm on smaller to medium sized river systems. Um, and that's also because it gives you a lot of increased stealth. So you don't have fly line crashing on the water a lot of the time. There's plenty of disadvantages with the mono rig. Typically, you can't fish very far away from yourself. Line management can be kind of tricky if you have um, a longer cast out and you're trying to strip monofilament. It's awful. Um, you're going to miss strip sets. It's very difficult to actually strip the line. So when you're fishing something like the mono rig, I'm generally using smaller streamers. I'm generally using the rod tip to kind of flick dance my little flies. So that's the flies where I was talking about some of the sculpins and the, the darters and the um, some of the slump busters I'm fishing. That's generally what I'm doing is I'm using my rod tip to be fishing upstream myself and I'm walking that streamer down by kind of little jigs and twitches. Not so much stripping. Sometimes I strip it because I had the fly a little too far away from myself and I am gonna be adding some strips to it as well. Um, one comment about fly size. When you are fishing the mono rig, and especially if you're doing so on your Euronymphing setup, be very cautious about how big the hooks are that you're fishing. Uh, I can't tell you how many fish I've probably lost over the years because I was fishing large sized hooks on very whippy soft tipped rods and they just don't have the strength to really uh, embed that hook in that bony jaw of a large trout. A... Um, I draw the line at about a size four. And I mean, we could get into the details. Some size four hooks can have a pretty thin wire on them. I really like those ones. And uh, I generally won't fish that on a, um, or I won't go any bigger than that on something on my mono rig or a rod that uh, has a lot softer tip. Oh, sorry, floating line sinking fly. I love this presentation. If I'm going out to fish streamers and I know I'm not going to do anything else, I'm fishing a floating line with a sinking fly. Reason why I get a lot more distance in my casting. I get some great casting accuracy um, by fishing this method. Uh, line management is really important. I can mend, I can sink the fly really down into the depths if I want to. Um, I can fish it really fast, keep it up nice and shallow. Um, and really the added benefit of those strip sets. I'm actually setting the hook with a proper strip set where I actually have a large thick fly line I can grab onto to really drive that hook home when I'm doing my strip sets. I'm not as concerned about things like the hook sizes and the diameters of my hooks. I can fish pretty much any streamer pattern I want in this way. Um, there are some disadvantages. I'm, I, if I'm fishing upstream of myself, there's going to be some increased slack. So I have to be very cautious to not end up with tons of slack when that fish eats and I miss that hook set, um, as well as a lack of presentation control or drag. 
when that fly line catches the current, you're really going to have some drag taking place on your flies. And uh, you can get limited action with a weighted fly. Um, if you have a lot of heavy weight on your actual fly, it's only going to follow that plane where it goes up and down. It's not going to really weave in and out um, like a fly would if it was unweighted and on a sinking line. So kind of go into sink tips and sinking lines. I fish this least of all of the other two methods. Um, it's really fun when I get to do so. Um, a lot of times when you read about streamer fishing online, you're going to read about sink tips and full sinking lines. Those are generally on larger rivers than we're fishing here in Ontario. A lot of this is from a drift boat um, where the fly is actually going to be downstream of you when you're fishing and um, and the rivers are larger, deeper. So you can fish, you know, sink tips and full sinking lines. Um, that said, I still love to do it when I get the opportunity. Um, you really get an increased action out of your fly. If your fly is unweighted and you have a full sinking line, that fly can go any which direction and it's going to go all over the place and that's a great presentation uh you can get a lot of depth from sinking lines hook sets as well flies in the water sinking lines in the water when that fish eats you're going to do a nice big strip set it just seems to be a lot easier i find with sink tips and full sinking lines or at least i remember to do it <laughs> with uh, full sinking lines but the disadvantages is, of course, you're less versatile. Uh, it can be really tricky if you're trying to fish a sinking tip or a, a full sinking line upstream of yourself. That's generally not the style that they're designed for. And then, of course, um, uh, you do lose a little bit of stealth when you have sinking lines crashing down on top of a, a fish when you're fishing. So uh, those are kind of the three main ones. Uh, for their smaller rivers, love to fish a, a mono rig. Uh, if I'm fishing a smaller river, but I know I'm just committed to streamers that day. I'm going floating lines. Um, so just a couple of points here. Uh, these are probably the most important slides, so I don't want to skip over them too quickly. Uh, but really, if, if you're interested in targeting larger trout, um, a lot of what I've already talked about will really help. But I think some of the most important factors are really like location, location, location. Targeting locations that large trout live is the best way to catch large trout. Uh, so finding the, these some of these river systems that have lots and lots of food available to the fish and have the potential to grow those fish is really important. Um, and then once you're on those river systems and and you know you you maybe you've talked to people or or you're aware that there's some large trout in the area, uh, finding the prime lies. So really the best holding water is going to be held by the largest fish in those systems. So um, they're they're territorial. They want the best spot. They want the spot that has the best cover, the best food, and uh, the best. Uh, area that they don't have to expend a lot of energy uh, when it comes to uh, to finding any of those things. So typically these can be things like focusing on the heads and tails of pools. When I first started fly fishing, I thought every big fish was in the deepest, darkest hole in the river. Not true. Um, the deepest parts of the river, I honestly will ignore a lot of the time. Um, I'm usually looking for the drops in the heads of the pools. I'm looking for the shallow tailouts with boulders in them that might offer some sort of hunting ground for those fish. And then I'm looking for undercuts and structure to fish around most of the time. I like a little bit of depth, but it's amazing what, what a large trout will be comfortable holding in uh, when they're feeding. If it's enough to cover their backs, you should probably throw your fly in there. Um, Ambush points are really key. So looking for areas that might have a little bit softer of a current, and then that fish can sit in that softer current and then hit anything that comes out past it in the, in the quicker current. Uh, that's a great spot to focus your efforts. And then if nothing's working, just go in and find the most amount of structure and uh, bust them out of the bunkers. I say like, throw something super heavy, get down in there. Don't be afraid to lose flies. Uh, it's amazing how you'll fish all around structure. You might not have... Um, caught anything and then you throw one Hail Mary pass just way into the log jam and sure enough 20 inch brown comes out and hammers it. Don't be afraid to lose flies because uh, often those fish are going to be caught or in the, the mess of structure. And then of course just how you how would you approach the river. I think it's a very underestimated but a really critical factor. Um, really trying to be stealthy. Maybe more so important than uh, more important than any sort of other factor out there. So if you spook the fish, you've already lost your shot at it. Um, so going out there, waiting carefully, waiting slowly. I'll typically wait upstream. That's my preferred method. That way, I'm approaching the fish from behind, um, and then not wearing any kind of like super bright colors or anything like that can be really important. Um, I'm you don't have to go nuts and wear camo and all kinds of different camouflage like hunters sometimes do but i think muted down colors can be really important um just so you don't give away your presence to the fish covering water versus target selection i think is really important as well so that's uh covering water is really if you don't know where the fish are covering water is key you want to learn the location for some of them um but then i think when you once you kind of get familiar with the addresses for a couple of larger fish and you want to go target them going with the intention of targeting that specific fish can be really really vital i think as i was saying um a lot of the fish that they might have popped up on the screen or a lot of the trout that i've caught that are 
I would consider to be quite large. I've already known about them in advance. I've gone out there with a specific game plan to target that one specific fish. Um, and I know roughly where it's going to be. So I'm not, I'm not fishing the whole pool. I'm going to where I think that that fish is going to be. And I'm targeting that first with some sort of approach that, uh, that I have confidence in that fish taking. And then the last comment there is just situational awareness. Once you hook that fish, you better have a game plan. Uh, a lot of times our fish live in very woody, tons of debris. Taking a moment before you make that first cast and thinking, what am I going to do if I hook the fish in my life in this situation? I've started to do that more and more, and it's really paid dividends. So I've already planned out in my head when that fish takes, I'm angling my rod this way because I don't want to steer that fish this way into the log jam that's sitting right there or some kind of snag or whatever. And then I'm going to land the fish over here and I've already got a game plan all in, in my head. Now, sometimes it goes awry and it never works out, but a lot of times that just that little moment of having a game plan of what I'm going to do when that fish takes, it can be really, really essential in landing that fish. When it comes to fighting big fish, you should be fighting them as fast as you can. Most large trout, I try to have in the net within 30 seconds. 30 seconds is even a stretch. I think it's even less than that, like 15 seconds. Usually connect with the fish, try to hang on for the first 10 seconds. And if you're pulling hard enough, you'll probably get an opportunity to net it. Um, especially if your gear is um, is kind of up to the same standard or up to the um, uh, size range of that fish. I didn't really talk too much about the tippets that I use, um, but I'm usually fishing a little bit more on the heavy side if I'm expecting to encounter larger fish. If I'm fishing streamers, even if I'm fishing on a mono rig or a tight line system, I'm still fishing about 10 pound. So not afraid to go super heavy. Um, I don't feel like fish are often very tippet shy, even if you're fishing the smallest streamers. So 10 pound, that's kind of my standard. I used to fish eight, I'm up to 10 now. I broke too many off on eight. Now, just a couple comments just about responsible angling. If you are targeting larger trout, um, of course, we want to be landing them as quickly as possible. Carrying a large landing net can really be beneficial. Um, you want to obviously handle the fish and be kind to it. It takes a very long time to, to, um, to grow these fish. We all share these fish as well. And if you haven't noticed that, like I'm mentioning that, you know, I caught repeated times um a lot of people in our angling community you can just look on instagram and just see fish hey i've caught that fish i know that fish we're all we're all catching the same fish over and over a lot of the time uh we really got to be careful when we're handling them or we're not going to have too many of them to to enjoy um as far as water temperature i know I'm, I'm speaking to a responsible angling group but uh as far as water temperature is concerned just be carrying a thermometer um a lot of times especially in some of our more marginal rivers, uh, the fish will really congregate around thermal thermal springs in the summertime. It's just not appropriate to be fishing those fish at that time. So yeah. um, if you're seeing that type of behavior, leave those fish alone, remember where they are, come back another time when the water's cooler and you know, you're not going to um, accidentally kill a fish just because you wanted to catch it. And then uh, just as far as social media and river access is concerned, um, it seems like more and more people are getting into fly fishing. Everybody wants to know where you caught that big fish. If you threw it on old Instagram or uh, some kind of social media outlet um i really firmly believe that these fish are often not moving a lot from their locations just, just be responsible if you're interacting on on social media and if you tell the world where you caught that one great big trout everybody's going to be there the next weekend and i'll tell you one thing that big big trout's not going to be there much longer so just be cautious in some of those behaviors yeah. yeah and then that's the end guys and girls 